Well, what a delight it is to be with you again. And uh, one of the highlights of uh, my trips coming to Southeast Asia is just to be with you. Amen. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you in your new facilities Amen. as well. Well, what a wonderful day this is on the Christian calendar. Christ has escaped death. Now, that reminds me of an American magician of the 19th, 20th century. He died in 1926, October 1926. Actually, he was an escape artist. Harry Houdini was his name. Maybe you've heard of Harry Houdini. Now, this guy could not be held by anything. They would put, a, put him in a straitjacket and... Uh, Put wrap chains around him. In seconds, he would be out. They would put him in a steel barrel and, and um, uh, seal the top and lower it down in the water. He would get out. And his most famous stunt was they would put him in a straight jacket, put chains all around him, and on the stage, there would be this glass tank filled with water. And they would would lower him head first. They would dangle him from this crane, um, uh, feet bound, put him down in that water, and he would escape. He could escape anything except death. Now, shortly before he died, he told his wife, he said, I'll find a way, and I'll, I'll escape. I'll come back to you. Well, for 10 years, on the anniversary of his death, his wife faithfully lit a candle before his portrait. Finally, after 10 years, she heard nothing from Harry Houdini, and she put the candle out. Well, death laid hands on Jesus Christ, and death put him into a rock-hewn tomb and the seal of the Roman government was put on that tomb. And, of course, on the third day, Jesus walked out, leaving the grave clothes behind. Christ passed through the walls of that rock-hewn tomb. And, by the way, the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away simply to let people see that it was empty. Christ is alive. He's not behind in any tomb, he's before us on the throne. But suppose that event never happened. Suppose death still holds Jesus Christ like it held, holds Harry Houdini. You remember the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection was Mary Magdalene. She went there uh, looking for the corpse and uh, hoping to persuade the soldiers to roll the, the stone away. You remember she was crying. She was crying because she couldn't find his body. And she told the, uh, asked the gardener, the man that she supposed was the gardener, they've taken the body of my Lord away. Do you know where it is? Tell me, and I'll go get it. Now, I'm glad she never found the body of Jesus because if she did find his body, you and I wouldn't be here today, would we? Yes. Now, but just suppose, just suppose she did find the body of Jesus and suppose he never was resurrected. What would happen? Well, I want to show you if Christ is not risen in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, there are several things six things precisely that would never have been or would be uh, certainly changed if Christ had never risen from the dead. Number one, if Jesus had never risen from the dead, preaching the gospel would serve no purpose. Preaching is without purpose. Look in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ is not risen, 
then our preaching is vain. It's empty. It's futile. It's without any purpose whatever. It's a waste of time. If there is no Easter, you and I are wasting our time being here today. I mean, I'm wasting my time preaching to you. You're wasting your time listening. You ought to be doing something more productive and more useful. If Christ is not risen, our preaching is worthless, it's fruitless. Why? Because the heart of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul said here in, in chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 3. He said, Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and uh, he rose again on the third day. And all of this, he said, is according to the Scriptures. And Paul said, this is the gospel. No preaching, then you cannot preach the gospel at all unless you preach the resurrection. Nobody, nobody who does not preach the gospel can is really preaching all, preaching the resurrection. You might as well not preach. The spirit of Jesus lives on, some preachers say, but his body is still in some nameless tomb. Well, I'll tell you this. Christ is alive. A preacher said to me one time, a pastor, uh, he was talking about the resurrection. He didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Oh, he believed the spirit of Jesus lives on and the ideals that Jesus taught. But his, it wouldn't surprise him, he said, if some archaeologist found the bones of Jesus in some forgotten tomb. And then he made this statement. He said, it wouldn't make a bit of difference in my preaching if Jesus had not risen from the dead. I told him I'm sure it wouldn't. Whatever he's preaching, it's not the gospel because you cannot preach the gospel without preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Any preacher who doesn't preach the resurrection ought to get out of the pulpit and get an honest job. If Jesus... I mean, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ came out of that grave, then preaching is useless, meaningless, totally empty. There's a second thing. If Christ is not risen, then your faith is foolish. Look again at verse 14. Preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you are trusting something that does not deserve your trust. Who wants to put his faith in Jesus if Jesus is dead? I mean, if Jesus cannot back up his claims. It's not enough to believe that Jesus died for our sins if you don't also believe that God raised him from the dead. Your faith is vain. Paul in Romans chapter 10 said that at verse 9, we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord, but we believe in our heart that Christ raised him from the dead. He said, you believe that and you're saved. Faith is foolish if we don't believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, the difference between Jesus and and the founders of every other religion on the face of this earth is the resurrection of Jesus. You see, the founders of all the world's other religions lived, and they taught, and they died, and they left behind some followers to carry on their teachings. But Jesus lived, and taught, and died, and rose again. There's no need to follow a loser. Jesus has escaped death. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that Jesus is shown to be the Son of God with power. How? By the resurrection from the dead. How do we know that Jesus is truly the Son of God? How do I know that he can save me? How do... I know that the Bible is true. 
How do I know that God is faithful to keep his promises and all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen? I'll tell you how I know. Because God brought, brought Jesus Christ forth from uh, death and that resurrection was God's stamp of approval on everything that Jesus did, did and everything that Jesus was. We don't serve a dead Savior. A dead Savior is nobody's Savior. There was this uh, school, a, a elementary school, and the teacher assigned the, the students uh, a, 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 a task of writing an essay. Now she, the teacher said, now you write an essay on who you consider to be the world's greatest living person. So the students wrote and they submitted their essays. Some of them had written about the president of the United States. Others had written about uh, entertainers and famous athletes and musicians and scientists and philosophers. Well, one boy wrote an essay on Jesus. The teacher read the paper and she brought it back to the boy and said, now that, that's a, a, a nice paper that you submitted, but you misunderstood. The assignment was for you to write on who you consider to be the world's greatest living person. And the boy looked at it and said, but teacher, he is living. If Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is foolish. And to trust somebody who is dead is to trust somebody who can do absolutely nothing for you. But there's a third thing. If Christ is not risen, then the disciples are deceivers. Look at verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not raise. We're false witnesses. Now, Paul is not saying if Christ is still in the grave, then we were mistaken. That's not what he said. He said we deliberately lied. We are false witnesses. Now, false witness is somebody who goes into the courtroom and deliberately, knowingly perjures himself. He lies. Paul said, we have testified that Jesus is alive. We, we, we have told people that we've seen him. We've talked with him. We ate with him. We fellowshiped with him. We touched him. And somebody would say, well, how do we know they didn't just make all that stuff up? Maybe they had to save face, so they told all these stories. How do we know? They just didn't fabricate a good story about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, I'll tell you why. The disciples paid for their testimonies with their very life's blood and their faith in Jesus. Now, hypocrites and martyrs are not the same thing. A person may live for a lie, but few people will die for a, a lie. Now, these people testified he's alive. We know he's alive. And they sealed their testimony with their lives. If Jesus is still in the grave, the disciples are liars, they're fakes, they're frauds, they're deceivers, they're con artists. Now, you mean to tell me that the apostle Paul was a cheat and a fraud? You mean to tell me that Peter was a deliberate deceiver and John was a liar and they all deceived the world with a colossal fraud? <clears throat> Another thing, if Jesus is not risen, then sin is sovereign. Look at verse 17. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and what? You are still in your sins. 
Now, what does it mean? It means simply this. If Jesus is still in the grave, then God did not accept payment for your sin. I mean, you still got to pay the penalty for your sin because the gospel is that Jesus took your sins. He bore the penalty for your sins on the cross, and God accepted that redemptive work by the resurrection. You see, when God raised Jesus up, that's proof that the full payment had been made. The reason that Paul wrote, he was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification. That means Christ died for our sins, but the work of redemption is incomplete until God raised Jesus from the dead. Without the resurrection, there is no hope of heaven. That Christ died for you is not important unless he also rose from the dead because that is God's stamp of approval and it's the authenticity of the full payment for your sins. No resurrection, no Savior. No Savior, no forgiveness. No forgiveness, no justification. No justification, no cleansing, no victory. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then you are still in your sins and you're destined for death and hell. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely and forever. And one day he's coming, glorious day. Now, <clears throat> we are no longer in our sins because we have a risen Savior who has paid the penalty for all of our sins. But there's another thing. If Christ is not risen, you know what that means? That means that death has dominion. Look at verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. <clears throat> that means that your mother, your father, your children, your loved ones, those that you hold dear to your heart, they, they're dead, they're gone, you'll never see them again, and they're there in the grave to rot and to decay. And you have no hope of any reunion, whatever. It's, it's all over. It's ended. Death has won. And life is just a colossal bad dream. I mean, you live for a few years on this earth and, and uh, it's all meaningless. Can you really believe that the intelligence that created this universe intends for it all to run down into the grave? Can you believe that we're born crying, we live complaining, and we die disappointed? And that's it? All we can hope for is to get older and more feeble and sicker and until we die, and it all ends in a veil of tears, and we rot and decay in the ground. That's it. I'm supposed to believe that. I'm supposed to believe that some grand scheme of things that made this entire universe and created something called man is to cause us all just to die, and death is a monster that has dominion? I cannot accept that. You see... I'm glad that I can come here today. I'm glad that I have a resurrection gospel to preach. I'm glad it doesn't all end in a veil of tears as we say goodbye and we never, never meet again. Our loved ones have gone and that's it. In ancient Rome, 
Christians were persecuted. Sometimes they were put into to the arena with wild animals. They made sport of believers in Christ. They put them, put them to death. So believers began to meet underground. They met in catacombs. And those catacombs are still there today beneath the city, the modern city of Rome. There are miles and miles of tunnels dug, uh, <clears throat> dug out of the, the rock. And they're about four to eight feet wide and about uh, six or eight feet tall. Now, on the walls, all along those tunnels, there are niches dug out of the rock where they buried the dead. But not only were Christians buried there, but also pagans are buried there. And to this very day, you can go there and you can read some of the inscriptions on those, those tombs. And as you read those inscriptions, you can see the difference between those who have hope and those who have no hope. Let me read to you two or three of the pagan inscriptions just to give you an example. Here's one. Live for the present hour since we're sure of nothing else. Another one. Once I was not and now I am not. Another one, traveler, curse me if you pass, for I am in darkness and cannot answer. But listen to some of the Christian inscriptions you can see there. Here lies Marcy, put to rest in a dream of peace. Lawrence, to his sweetest son, carried away by the angels. Here's another one. He went away in peace. And I like this one victorious in peace and in Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes a difference. A young Christian man's wife died, and, and he took his little preschool son to the funeral home. Now, the body of the young woman was almost lifelike, so very beautiful, and the man tried to explain death to this little boy and tried to explain to him that they would not see uh, his mother again unto heaven. And he said, no, Dad, you're wrong. She's just asleep. I've seen her like that a lot of times, just asleep. So he began shouting, Mom, wake up. Wake up, Mom. And with tears, the father said, Son, you can't wake her up now. But when Jesus comes, he'll wake her up. And that's true. The dead in Christ will rise first. But if there's no Easter, then death has the last word, and death has conquered. There's another thing. If Christ is not risen, then the future is futile. The future has no meaning, no hope. Look at verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable. What does this mean? It means that if this is all there is, then it's just bad news. The good times are just for a moment. And it's going to get worse. You're going to get older and sicker and weaker. You're going to have problems. You'll get infirmed. Some disease is going to eat away at your body. And uh, then one by one, you'll see all your loved ones stripped away by death. Ernest Hemingway, the atheistic writer, wrote these words. We are like a colony of ants living on one end of a burning log. Now, what do people without Christ have to look forward to? Nothing more than a hole in the ground. Without Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 
The whole thing, this whole thing of time and space is just a bad joke. It makes no sense at all. It's chaotic if Christ is not raised. That means the future is fearful and futile if Christ is not raised. But I want to tell you, Christ is risen. Look at verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Because Christ is risen, then preaching is profitable and faith is feasible and the disciples are dependable and sin is overcome and subdued and death is defeated and the future is fabulous. Jesus has taken the sting out of death. He's taken the gloom out of the grave. He's taken the dread out of death. He's taken uh, everything uh, negative, turned it into a positive. He's given us a hope that is steadfast and, and true. I read a fable about this, this spider in the jungle. Now, this spider was very, very envious of the lion. And the lion would just strut around, just like he was the boss over everything. And the spider had a growing resentment of the lion. Well, one day, the lion strolled into this cave to take a, take a nap. And the spider says, ah, I've got him now, and uh, I'm going to imprison him. So he went to that cave, and he spun a web across the mouth of that cave. And he said, I've got him. He's my prisoner. He won't prowl the jungle anymore, and he won't strut around like a king and lord it over us. He's my captive. I'm going to enslave him. And uh, he can't escape. Well, it wasn't long before the lion woke up, stretched, shook himself, and he let out a roar that echoed all over the jungle, yawned, and then he walked right out of that cave and never knew that that web was there. Well, you see, sin and hate and rebellion against God wove a web of unbelief across the tomb of Jesus. But the lion of the tribe of Judah has risen from the dead, and he never even knew that the devil's flimsy web was there. Jesus is alive and I can testify to you, I know beyond doubt that he's alive because he lives in my heart. Amen. And there are many of you I know that can testify the same thing. It might be that some of you cannot give that testimony because you haven't experienced Jesus as living in your heart. If that's you, I want to pray and I want you to pray with me that you will say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to experience you as a living Christ, not just somebody I read about, not just somebody that they talk about as living a good life and having great teachings. I want to know you personally. So let's pray right now. Lord, we rejoice we rejoice that we do have a gospel of resurrection to preach. Thank you, Lord, that we don't worship a dead Savior. We worship a living, living Savior. Thank you for the resurrection. Now, Father, I pray right now for anybody here that does not know Christ as Savior. I pray, my Lord, right now, in fact, if you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart, right now would you pray, Oh, Lord, save me. Lord, I repent of my sins. Lord, I trust you as my Savior. I want, 
I ask you to forgive my sins. Lord, come into my life. Lord, I surrender to you. I want to serve a living Savior. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, we all rejoice. Those of us who know you, Father, I pray that we'll do more than just celebrate the resurrection right now, today. But, Father, I pray that we'll leave here today to serve a living Savior and to tell others he is risen and just to show and to demonstrate the reality of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.